Hi, everybody. I'm Hector. I lead uh, client services here at Casa and uh, welcome to Manage Your Keys to Secure Your Wealth. Today, we're going to be talking all about how to, uh, how to apply these concepts of cryptography and, um, and really how to you know start using those as building blocks to practically speaking, secure substantial amounts of wealth, make sure that we're, uh, that we're doing this for the long run. So like I said, Ali Client Services been at Casa for uh, coming up on on two years here. A couple of years in the uh, doing blockchain stuff. A couple of years doing uh, doing some startup crypto stuff um, as well. And uh, and yeah, my uh, my background is originally in the uh, in the U.S. Navy. So I'm kind of bringing it all together here at Casa Security, doing the uh, the economics, the finance stuff, and obviously this uh, working on working on cutting edge technology, but making sure that we're able to. Uh, to do this in a way that uh, that's helping people uh, build up their uh, build their assets and their uh, their net worth for the long run, and uh, and now I'll turn it over to Jesse. Hey everybody, my name is Jesse Bookspan. Uh, I run the sales department here at Casa. Spent the last few years before joining the team here uh, working in programmatic media, uh, using all sorts of different you know, new centralized ledger, distributed ledger technologies. Um, but yeah, background in sales, startups, early stage companies. I want to kick this off with uh, with something a little bit fun here. So you know, if you guys have been in some of the other se sessions, you'll probably have heard you know what is a private key, how does it work, all that good good stuff. Um, and the bottom line is that when we get started at the base level, a private key is just a random string of information. It's just data. It's sitting out there. It has no value to it until uh, until we actually assign assign value to it by sending a transaction there by signing it over. So yeah, you can go on a, one of my favorite sites is, uh, is keys.lol. Um, you lo load that site up and it will literally list every single Bitcoin pri private key in existence, not just the ones that are used to list all of them. Um, and you can, uh, you can spend forever refreshing that page, hoping that you stumble ac across the private keys to Satoshi's coins. Um, the likelihood of you doing that is, uh, is, is pretty low. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, all the keys are out there and it's all just data until we assign value to it by sending a Bitcoin transaction over there. So one thing I did want to point out here is that we do have this, uh, this random string of, string of bits. Um, and, uh, you know, you got your, your private key up there in purple, um, your public key down there in, uh, in green. Um, and, uh, and if there's enter any enterprising people out there, um, fast, uh, fast fingers on the keyboard, um, there is real Bitcoin secured at this, uh, at the, this address right right now. Um, so if you're uh, if you're quick on the fingers, got a got an electrum pulled up. That is a uh, that is a bounty sitting there waiting for uh, for whoever from this from this chat is uh, is going to be quick, quick enough to, quick enough to, uh, to to grab that. Um, and basically, we use uh, you know we use private keys obviously in addition to Bitcoin transactions, encrypt and decrypt messages, create and verify digital signatures, and a lot more. All right, so let's start talking about like how we store these keys. And I'm starting at a really high level here because it's important to kind of get these concepts down so that we, uh, we're thinking about this stuff the right way. And, uh, and keys are really the building blocks of all that we do in Bitcoin and all that we do in cryptography. So we know that, that uh, a key is just a piece of data, a bunch of different ways that we can actually store that data. Um, that data can obviously be stored most naturally on a, on a general purpose computing device as your desktop computer, that is a mobile phone. Uh, those, are kind of the, those are kind of the two big ones right now, tablets, obviously. All these general purpose, purpose computing devices are super, you know, they're everywhere right now. We're all, we're all using them all the time. Um, general purpose is great. It means there's tons of features. It means that, you know, developers can build cool software that's, uh, that's able to manipulate these keys and do fun, exciting nonsense with them, send it out to the internet, bring it back in. Lots of fun stuff you can do with, uh, you know, when, you're, when your key is on a, a general purpose device. And uh, general purpose devices pretty much all the time these days are web enabled. You know, they're gonna have your Wi-Fi cards in them at, at the bare minimum, it's gonna have an ethernet port. Most things come with Wi-Fi. Um, and that's great too. It's great for connect connectivity, for, uh, you know, for being able to interface with the entire world out there. So there's one, uh, one particular drawback about managing your keys on a general purpose device though, is that these things are basically easy to hack. Um, and sorry, one other uh, one other one I'll get to in a minute here is that is servers, but that kind of falls into the other. You know, a machine that can run any code in the world can also run any code in the world that we don't want it to. Um, and there's a lot of hackers out there that are going to be trying to trick you into running malicious code on your uh, on on your screen. So while it's great from a uh, from a usability perspective, um, it's not great from a security perspective. 
Um, the other benefit, though, that we do have on uh, on desktop and mobile, and I'll talk about this a little more in a second too, but uh, these keys can be backed up because they're web enabled. You can back them up. Secure secure cloud storage again makes it harder to very hard to lose these keys, um, but also exposing them potentially to hackers that are out there. So because of these trade offs that uh, that general purpose devices have, we've come up with a uh, with a hardware vault and uh, and hardware keys. Hardware keys are special purpose devices your ledgers, your treasures, your cold cards, also non-crypto, uh, non non-Bitcoin specific keys as well. Like the, uh, like the YubiKey, for instance, is another example of this, uh, of, this, of, this hard, of this hardware device. And these things take a totally different approach. They are special purpose devices. All they do is they hold that key on them and then they sign stuff. That's literally all they're designed to do. And, and the design goal there is to make sure that the attack surface is as small as possible. So. You know, so it's really hard to extract the private key from, from these devices. Um, obviously, anytime that there's even a risk or a whiff or a hint of that being possible, it is major news in the industry. You know, they, uh, they were able to prove, for instance, that you could, you know, if you were an extremely experienced hardware hacker and you had access to all the right tools and you had physical access to, uh, to one of the older models of the treasures, that you could, in theory, actually extract that, uh, actually extract that, that private key and that seed phrase off of the device. Um, you know, these things are certainly possible, but that is a really high level of attack that you have to have to get to when compared with, you know, a, a file that's sitting on your computer that a, uh, you know, that, that a hacker might just be able to kind of, kind of get a hold of. So we think of hardware devices as very hard to hack. They're very difficult to exploit, particularly exploit remotely, um, exploit from another country or, uh, you know, from, from, from another, uh, another jurisdiction. Now the trade-off here is that these are single-purpose devices. Um, they're pretty easy to lose. They're pretty e easy to break because you don't have them backed up online. We think that they're uh, they're certainly at they're certainly at a substantially higher risk of losing them. So we got our desktop and mobile, which are hard to lose, easy to hack. We got our hardware, which is hard to hack but easy to lose. And I'm going to touch on uh, touch on some others here as well. Um, First of all, you know, obviously within the Bitcoin ecosystem, we use uh, we use the secret phrases a lot. We write these things down on pieces of paper, and that's to uh, make sure we keep them backed up. And we also, you know, put them down on steel. Jameson obviously loves to play around with his blowtorch and uh, and you know high high capacity oven to see how uh, how firmly these things will hold up. Um, paper and steel keys are fully offline. They have no interaction whatsoever with um, you know with with computers, and that's that's by design. Um, at the same time, they're pretty much impossible to use when stored in that medium. Um, if there's anyone out here who can run through the uh, you know the 50 pages of calculus that you would have to do to actually generate a Bitcoin transaction, um, you know by scratch using using pen and paper instead of a hardware device or a, or a computer, I'm uh, that's that's incredibly impressive. But I'm going to call this impossible to use for 99.999 percent of the population. And then finally, I'm going to touch on this uh, this other one, which I like to call uh, one way to store your keys is not your keys. Um, these are, you know, this is and this is how the enterprise infrastructures run these days. Not your keys are the private keys that are managed by yeah. corporations. that are managed by, uh, you know, by Google, by Apple, by Amazon, every major company that's at, that's out there. Um, and you have, you know. They can uh, they can encompass a wide range of uh, wide range of features. You pretty much the sky's you know this the sky's the limit when it comes to uh, you know what an enterprise uh, an enterprise grade security team can do to manage keys. Um, but from the user perspective, like you're already hacked. Those keys are already gone. Those are already those keys are already out there uh, kind of out, out there in the ether. Um, and I do like to kind of frame this this last one because uh, this is how we think about you know Casa does maintain a key on behalf uh, for our clients and a lot of uh, a lot of bitcoins a lot of bitcoin companies will do this um and it's important that you uh you kind of assume that you know you the trade-off you're getting here is that you have a big company backing this thing up but from your perspective any key that is not in your control is already exposed um and that's uh and that's really one of the defining features of the internet today is that our entire security model is managed by someone else. It's managed by infrastructure teams at these major tech companies, these major financial companies. Um, and to me, this is one of the major underlying flaws of the architecture of the internet today, is that at the end of the day, we don't have control over our keys, which means we don't have control over our data, we don't have control over our connections, we don't have control over our assets, we'll have control ultimately over, over our, our digital life, which is becoming you know, a huge part of the, your everyone's entire life these days. 
All right, so that covers the three different ways you can store your keys. Um, I always like to kind of uh, kind of take, take a break here and, uh, and step back. And it's important to remember, these are not mutually exclusive. The key is just that piece of data. It can be stored on desktop, mobile, and it can be stored on hardware, and it can be stored on, on paper. Um, and obviously, it's hard to it's hard to undo anytime you put a key in a uh, in a particular uh, in a particular medium. It's hard to undo that. So we want to be very careful and very cognizant of, uh, of where our keys are, how we're man managing them, um, and whether or not we think of this as like, hey, this key is uh, you know, this key this key is pretty available, or this key is pretty secure, and we're and we're keeping track of those things to manage them appropriately. All right, so we talked a bit about keys. Now I want to talk about uh, I want to talk about how we actually use keys to store Bitcoin. Um, this gets into a little bit of the history of, uh, of how how this has been done in the past and what's uh, what's currently happening these days. So when Bitcoin got started, um, you know there wasn't a lot of risk there. The value was pretty much negligible, and it was totally fine to use the keys that uh, are just generated right there on your computer. That's what most people. Uh, most people were doing back then. Um, if you guys caught Ron and Stacy's talk yesterday, they went into a lot of detail about uh, the different kinds of addresses, pay to pub key hash, which is the uh, the OG, the original way that Bitcoin transactions were spent, um, pay to script hash, which is much more uh, the way things are going these days, um, and then bare multisig, which is uh, which is the way you could do multisig before uh, you know before pay to script hash really became a thing. So this chart down here is showing you uh, the percentage of Bitcoin over the past five years. Uh, percentage on the left, number of Bitcoin on the right. Uh, they're stored in uh, in these pay to pub key hash addresses, and this is the uh, this is the the old kind of address. You can see that uh, you can see it was pretty much almost all Bitcoin was stored this way um, up until the middle of 2017. Obviously, then we had the fork wars. We had uh, Segwit. We had Segwit released. And since then, the uh, number of keys that are, sorry, the amount of Bitcoin that's stored in a pub key hash has really shot, shot way, way down. Um, and it's kind of continuing this, uh, this, this downward trend. So these days, we tend to use hardware keys a lot. We tend to do a uh, pay to script, script hash a lot. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. All right, so I love this chart here. Because this shows you, and this is all on ch on chain analysis that is uh, that is done by I believe this is uh, this is definitely Bitmex research, and I believe it's in partnership with um, with co with Coin Metrics. And so what they do here, and this is again the last the last five years, um, and we can see the uh, and we can see the how many addresses were being used in this uh, in this pay to script hash uh, type of deal. Obviously, this has taken off a lot since uh, since since twenty seventeen. Um, and what you can see here is these just different kinds of multi-sig scripts that have been, um, you know, that have basically been uh, been in use for the, past, for the past five years. And what this tells you is that after, you know, you know, the uh, after SegWit was uh, was released, this is really uh, this approach has really has really skyrocketed. Um, one thing I'll point out is that there's this big green area down here at the bottom. Uh, if you can if you can see that. That means uh, that's unknown. We don't know what uh, what kind of scripts are are being used in those. Um, but what it tells you is that we actually know whenever whenever you know there's a lot of these scripts that are being used that we do know what the multisig underlying it looks like. Um, and the reason why that's important is that with some of the changes that uh, that you're going to see with um, with Schnorr Taproot, which I'll touch on a little bit at the end, is going to really increase the amount of privacy that we have right now. Um, your transactions are private. You can't tell that something is going to a two of three or a three of five or a two of two or a one of one um, when you're paying into a new address. But when you spend out of that address, that information is re revealed to the blockchain. It's just whatever the type of the type of address it, it was, the script conditions. Um, but we're lo really looking excited to improve on the privacy front once we uh, once we start to implement Schnorr and Taproot in the coming uh, you know in the, in the coming hopefully. Hopefully within the next year or so, but uh, we'll see how things go on the uh, on the mining front. All right, so that covers kind of history. We talked about different ways that there are to store your keys, um, all these different uh, these different potential approaches that that you can use. Um, and then we talked about how we start to kind of combine keys together to create these new kinds of scripts, these new kinds of multi-sig accounts, whether it's a two of three, a three of five, a two of two, on you know one of seven. There's an infinite number of uh, of kind of 
of approaches that you can take to designing a multi a multi sig contract, a multi sig script. At Casa, we've spent a lot of time thinking really hard about this um, and have come to some uh, some design decisions that really take a lot of the guesswork out of it, make this a lot more simple, and uh, and allow us to design not just the technology um, that's going to allow you to secure your wealth for the long run, but build in repeatable habits. Um, and repeatable kind of security approaches that allow us to kind of manage this in a much more, uh, you know, kind of much more contained, approachable, and ultimately user user friendly fashion that's going to be with us for uh, for for the long run. That's what we do here all day. And uh, I'm now going to turn over to Jesse, who's going to talk specifically about the design decisions decisions that we've made uh, in with Casa Keymaster. Thanks, Hector. Ah uh, yes, yeah, so my name. Anybody else getting a? Oh, there we go. So my name is Jesse Bookspan. Again, uh, Hector just did a great overview of all of the different possibilities and things to consider when you're thinking about storing Bitcoin. Uh, when it comes to storing large quantities of Bitcoin, uh, that is really where it becomes sort of high stakes, right? That you make sure you're thinking about all the risks properly and addressing them in your wallet setup. Uh, so, as I'll assume some people on this call, likely most people are familiar with a hardware device, ledger, treasure, cold card. We'll refer to those so far as single signature wallets. Uh, they have one private key. That private key is sort of the end all be all to your Bitcoin wallet. If you lose it and you don't have it backed up, well, you have lost your Bitcoin, unfortunately. If you have backed up, your, your, seed, your uh, private key with a seed phrase, well, then you can restore it. However, the seed phrase in and of itself can and frequently is a point of compromise in a setup. And what that means is a seed phrase is quite simply usually 24 words written down on a piece of paper. If anybody at any point sees those words, takes a picture, makes a copy, without you knowing, they have keys to the castle. They can take your Bitcoin that day or in a more terrifying scenario for me personally, they can monitor your wallet and say, oh, Jesse's adding Bitcoin every month and then steal my Bitcoin in 10 years. Uh, and so really when it comes to securing large amounts of Bitcoin, the name of the game is eliminating single sources of failure, right? And what that means is a scenario where one thing could go wrong and it could result in me losing my Bitcoin. Single signature wallets have single sources of failure. By definition, the way that they function, if you're going to do it right, they're going to have a single source of failure. Multisig addresses that. And multisig sounds like a big fancy word. What it stands for is quite simply multiple signature wallet. Single signature, single source of failure. Multi-signature, no single sources of failure. That's the name of the game. Now, as Hector talked about, right, 99.99% .99 of people are not going to be able to do the 50 pages of calculus uh, to send a transaction without a dedicated piece of software. With multisig, it's very similar. While the technology is built into Bitcoin at a foundational level, 99.9% uh, .9 of people aren't going to be able to make an effective multisig setup without a little bit of help. And that is where CASA comes in. CASA is built right, and founded on the principles that multi-sig is sort of the end game in Bitcoin security, especially for large quantities, uh, and that these wallets should be available to everybody, right? not just the 0.1% that's technical enough to get. And so what CASA has done is taken into effect and consideration really all the factors that Hector talked about earlier uh, to create the most diverse, redundant, secure non-custodial multi-signature wallet possible. What we're looking at here on our screen is a CASA three of five wallet. Uh, what this means is that rather than where there's a one of one single signature wallet in a three of five, you have five total signatures. Each one is unique and each one is only one fifth of your of access to your wallet. So there is no Bitcoin stored on any one signature, which means that no signature, no key, we'll use those terms synonymously, uh, is critical. And we'll walk through this setup and hopefully it becomes clear that by using a three of five wallet setup through CASA, it will be highly unlikely, in fact, almost impossible, 
uh, for there to be a loss event um, that results in you not having access to your Bitcoin. The two things here to consider as we go through, right, is the diversity of technology platforms that we're storing our keys on, and also the geographic diversity where the keys are stored physically, like in the real world. That is how you build security. The first key we'll talk about is this top key. It looks like an iPhone. This is the Casa mobile key. It is accessed and generated through the Casa app on your phone. It's important to note that while you're accessing the key through the Casa app, it is never exposed to us as a company. We will never be able to see it and we will never be able to use it to sign. It is very much your key. It is then encrypted and backed up onto your cloud provider. What that means is should you lose your phone, your phone gets stolen, the screen gets cracked, whatever, when you get your new device and log into your cloud provider and the Casa app, you will be able to restore your mobile key. So it is very secure, very resilient, but also very convenient. The next three keys we'll talk about are all unique hardware devices, and they are included in Casa's premium memberships. We have an authorized reseller of treasures, ledgers, and cold cards. Uh, so all the devices that you receive from Casa come in the tamper evident manufacturer sealed boxes. However, if you do not trust the Casa supply chain, you are more than welcome to procure your own hardware, so long as they are made by those three manufacturers. Those are the manufacturers that we offer support for. First one we'll talk about is this home key. Right? In my case, we'll say it's a Trezor One. I keep this in a fire and waterproof safe in my home. Right? Just a little $40 safe that I get off Amazon. The goal here is to protect against fire and water, not necessarily a crowbar. It's important to know who has access to that safe, who knows the combination. You definitely want to monitor that. In this case, it's only family members. And because it's in my home, it is accessible 24-7, right, which is important. You want to make sure you can get to your keys when you need them. Now, I've also considered in this case natural disasters, right? I don't necessarily live in a place that is prone to them. But if I did live in a place where hurricanes, tornadoes, wildfires, volcanoes were a serious concern, I would maybe want to think about distributing the keys to my multi-sig wallet so much so that one you know, hurricane or one tornado would not be able to affect uh, the majority of the keys in my wallet. The next key we'll talk about here right, is an office key. Again, this will be a Trezor One. So, so far we have three keys, two of them are Trezors and one of them is a mobile key. It's important to mention that the key quorum for a three of five wallet will always be three signatures. You will need three signatures always in order to withdraw. So between using a mobile key, a home key, and an office key, that could be, in effect, your key quorum. Now the office key, right, for me, my office is 15 minutes from my home. It's a different location. I keep this key again, fire and waterproof safe. Uh, this time only two people know the combination to that safe, which is important. It is accessible 24 seven, but my office has a security guard at the front desk, video cameras, elevators. Um, and my office is again, risk neutral to natural disasters, not something that I am concerned about. However, if I lived in an area prone to them, it would very much be something I would wanna mitigate against. Third key here, again, is a hardware device. It is a Ledger Nano S. So you have two treasures and a Ledger. It's important that you never have three keys that are the same technology platform, because that could potentially be a single point of compromise, single source of failure, right? If you had, let's say, all three keys were Trezor Ones, and hypothetically there was a hack for Trezor One, that could potentially result in a critical loss to your wallet. Three keys are compromised, three keys is the key point. So by having a diversity of hardware providers, you mitigate against a technological attack that could result in a critical loss. This key is typically kept in like a third party um, site. So maybe a vacation home that's a couple hundred miles away, a bank security deposit box. Uh, maybe you have a friend who you trust that you would be willing to give the key to. By trusting them with this key, you're not exposing the balance of your wallet to this friend. They won't know how much Bitcoin you have. And remember, you'll always need three keys to sign. So it's not like you're trusting them not to knock you off and take some of your Bitcoin they won't have the capability to do it. They're literally just a key warehousing service for you. 
But the idea here is that you need to know that if you need that key, the individual you're trusting will be responsible enough to have not lost track of it during the time you've trusted them holding it. The fifth and final key in a CASA setup is the emergency recovery key. This is the one and only key that is accessible to CASA. We store it in deep cold storage. It's accessible only by our executives and only in the case of an emergency upon request by you. Uh, there's a customizable security protocol that you go through during account setup with client advisors, much like Hector, uh, where you customize this security process. You even can identify panic phrases uh, so that if you request an emergency recovery key and Hector calls you to say, hey, I saw that this uh, request came in. I wanted to make sure everything's OK. Uh, both Hector can make sure there's not scary people in the room with guns to your head. Right. You're not being forced to make this request. You're not under duress. Uh, but also will give you a chance to say your duress word, to say your panic phrase, maybe ask him you know, how his children are, or how the weather is. Whatever you identify as that trigger, uh, you can give that notice to Hector and he will not apply that emergency recovery sign uh, key signing and you will have some time and optionality to figure out how to get out of that situation. I do always like to point out that when it comes to saying a duress phrase, it's important that this is something that, uh, that you know, you might say in everyday conversation. Um, if you, you know, if your duress phrase is Craig Wright is the real Satoshi, um, you might as well just say someone has a gun to my head. So don't go with that. Think hard about, you know, what's something that you could bring up in a, in a casual conversation. Great point. Yeah. If it doesn't sound natural, uh, probably, you know, it doesn't take someone with too high an IQ to figure that one out. Uh, but yeah, you'll see that by having your keys over diversity of technology platforms, diverse set of technology platforms, and also having them spread out throughout geographic locations, you can mitigate against all of the most common ways people lose Bitcoin, those being user error, right? With Casa, you have a pretty app, really easy to use. You have great customer service, um, in my opinion, best in Bitcoin. Um, you can mitigate against physical attack, right? You separate your keys geographically makes it highly unlikely that any physical attack will be successful in stealing your Bitcoin. You can mitigate against natural disaster, uh, right? Hurricanes, floods, fires, house fires, that sort of thing. Uh, with multi-sig, you can address that. And then my favorite is you mitigate against third-party risk, right? Uh, CASA is totally non-custodial. So while all this looks very pretty and is super easy to use, you can rest assured knowing that you are not trusting CASA. You are not replacing a single source of failure with CASA. Um, should the CASA app cease to function, uh, the company disappears, everybody in the company dies in the same day, uh, this wallet is fully recoverable uh, via open source software, mainly Electrum. Um, and as long as you have your hardware wallets, right, the three keys, you will be able to access your funds without ever touching CASA software or a CASA server. Um, now also, right, because your Bitcoin is no longer on an exchange, you're not subject to that type of counterparty risk as well, meaning should an exchange go bust suddenly, it will not affect you, you won't lose a single Satoshi. I would really think about CASA um, as a super easy to use wallet management software platform that pairs on a key warehousing service and also best in Bitcoin customer support. All right. Thanks a lot, Jesse. Okay. So uh, for those of you uh, keyboard warriors that are ready to go, I haven't checked my uh, wallet recently, but uh, there's your, uh, there's, there's your private key. If anyone wants to, uh, wants to run off and try to try, try to grab that. Um, yep. Looks like it's uh looks like it's uh balance is confirmed still there. So uh, off, off to the races. Um, but yeah, Jesse, uh, Jesse mentioned a, a couple things there that I just want to uh, want to expand on a little bit. Um, yeah. Casa is, I think of it as three things. Um, we are a key management service, first and foremost. Um, we help you manage your keys, and then we manage one on your behalf. And uh, and that's that's really what's at the root of all this. You know, a lot of times I'll get clients who are like, I, I love you guys, but I want to make sure that I'm not putting too much tr trust in you. And we say, absolutely. Like, we want you to uh, to understand how this stuff works. We want to be an unnecessary part of, uh, of, of your setup but something that you get so much benefit from. And it looks like I got an unconfirmed outbound transaction. So congratulations, congratulations to whoever, uh, whoever grabbed that. Someone wants to RBF, uh, RBF in a higher fee, go for it. Um, 
so yeah, it's uh, you know, someone will say, we love you guys, really like what you're doing, but how, you know, how do I, how can I trust you? Um, and I say, look, download Bitcoin Core, um, download Spectre that runs right, runs right on top of Bitcoin Core, um, or Electrum. We've, uh, our, our current, uh, protocol is to use Electrum. We're updating it potentially to use Spectre as well. Um, but download any open source, uh, open source wallet that's able to create these kinds of, these kinds of scripts. And you can go in and verify exactly what we say we are doing under the hood, not talking to CASA systems whatsoever. Um, that's why I like to emphasize this, uh, this key management part. That's really where the service that we're providing. The wallet is convenience. The wallet is so that you can go in to our app and through a nice interface, send Bitcoin. Um, but you can use any wallet in the world to do that. Uh, there's a couple of things that we do to try to keep you extra safe. Um, technical details like creating too many future addresses that coins can just kind of start to get lost and hard to find. Um, but under the hood, you know, you are free to use any wallet, any open source wallet in the world that supports simple P2SH Bitcoin multi-sig. What we want to provide is we want to provide the best tools for managing the keys themselves. We want to provide world-class support for helping you understand what it is that we're doing, how we're doing it, um, and able to, uh, to respond to any, uh, any questions, issues, concerns, or even emergencies that come up along the way. Um, so let's talk about what comes next. Um, and I'm not even really talking about uh, about Casa here. I'm just talking about Bitcoin in general because my view personally is that we're about to see an explosion of new products and features um, that leverage multi-sig and particularly leverage Schnorr Taproot when that comes out. Um, I'm expecting to see more time locks. I'm expecting to see better privacy. I'm expecting to see, you know, if then statements where something will transition from, you know, from a three of five to a two of three after a couple of years, and then maybe even to a one of one after that, um, the sky is really the limit when it comes to, uh, you know, when it, when it comes to what we can start to start to build as a community on, uh, on top of, uh, on top of Bitcoin and on top, top of multi-sig um, in the, uh, in the coming years. So I'm extremely ex excited about that. Um, and, I, and I hope you guys are too. And, and I would like to point out, you know, we, uh, we're not hiring, currently at this exact instant for more people on the uh, on the uh, on the sales and and ops and ops team that Jesse and I are a part of but i see that what i do every day of helping people manage their keys and uh, helping them understand the technical side of this but in a way that they are in full control i see this as an entire career field of the future it's going to key management is going to man is going to rival wealth management it's going to ri rival law it's going to rival medicine in terms of an entire professional class of people that uh that help other people do the hard around the hard parts of uh of, of technology to make sure that you know they're able to maintain sovereign access to not just their wealth um certainly their wealth over the long run certainly their, their bitcoin over the long run but also their data you know again i go back to the, this point that i made earlier that the entire infrastructure of the internet depends on third-party companies being the only ones that are trusted to manage private keys. Um, and the hardware wallet is this incredible invention that allows you to take personal user-friendly control of those keys in your own hands. The innovation that Casa does is a, uh, you know, I think of, I think of us, we're all standing on the shoulders of giants here. Um, I think the little innovation that we came up with is that an approach to three of five multi-sig management that just makes this a little bit more straightforward, uh, provides a lot of service, provides kind of a, a set approach to how to, to how to do it, um, and we're just you know we're we're just one vendor out there that's uh, that's kind of offer, offering offering one solution that's going to allow for this entire world to open up of uh, of cryptographic management that at the end of the day is going to rearchitect the internet itself um, and is and is also going to really empower the users and bring that security all the way down to the end user level so we don't have to trust giant corporations whether they're banks tech companies governments etc um to kind of manage the security for us we're taking back control of of the internet um and cause is really excited to be a part of uh be a part of that that mission so the last thing i'll do here is uh is touch on why we kind of think about all these different uh, all these different things, and I do want to shift from a technical discussion to kind of a financial one. And ultimately, with Bitcoin, these are the same thing. Technology is finance. Finance is is technology. These things are going to meld together in uh, in incredible ways over the coming years. But one thing from the financial side that I like to think about, and it works from my military background as well, is that what we do here is risk diversification. 
we want to make sure that your keys, are, the way that you're storing your keys is diversified so that any risk to one piece of your three of five key shield or your three of six key shield does not mean that your funds are lost. Um, this is why we store our keys in different locations. We store them on different mediums. Some of them we back up to the cloud. Um, some of them we make sure they are so secure um, that you know that the only place that key exists is on the hardware wall. We even tell you to burn the seed, the seed phrase. Um, again, these are these these kinds of these sound kind of crazy if you're new to Bitcoin, if you're new to multi-sig in particular. Um, you're like, wait, why am I burning my seed phrase in, with one key and then I'm backing the other one up to the cloud? It's because we can now assume that uh, that these keys are doing different jobs for us. Um, they're easy to lose. They're easy easy to replace. They're hard hard to lose, but maybe they're uh, you know maybe they're they're e easy to be hacked. And so if that if that happens, we we go that route. Um, ultimately, what you're doing is you're diversifying how your security is managed. And when you do that, you know bad things happen. And this is one of the other advantages of working with a company like Casa. You are 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 an N of one. If one bad thing ha happens to you, you might be the one person to, in the world to catch that edge case, that really that really horrible horrible thing. Um, but if you're a Casa client, we are we are managing the security for everybody. Um, we have to think about the best ways to protect the largest group of people possible, which includes addressing all those edge all those all those edge cases. Um, and what I'm getting at at with that is that you know over the over the long long run, risk happens. Bad things happen. Um, what Multisig gets you, and what Casa gets you, is it buys you time. Because when you get hacked, when you lose a key, when any of these uh, any of these kind of negative event events happen, all you have to do is kind of say, okay, now I've dropped down from a three of five to a three of four, and I got a problem, and I got to address it. So let's go ahead and uh, and address that, replace that key, or restore that key, whatever the whatever the appropriate model is. Um, but it allows you to retain access to your uh, your kind of key set as a whole and to re and to retain the uh, the integrity of your uh, of your your control of your bitcoin over the long run and that's really what it's, what it's all about here um risk diversification means diversifying the different kinds of ways you're sto you're storing your keys uh we borrow that concept from finance that's like hey make sure you're not all invested in one stock see we're not telling people to uh, diversify their their assets here we are a bit bitcoin company um but diversifying your keys is really the uh, is really the core idea behind the long term sustainable security of the key shield. All right, and that covers like the uh, everything that I had on the agenda here. But I didn't want to uh, want to kind of open it up for questions at this point. Um, yeah, if you drop uh, questions in the chat, I will do my best to prompt them to Hector, um, and we'll use the last few minutes here, um, hopefully, to address any burning questions you have. All right, so the first question that I did want to, want to address, I saw this this in the chat, is you know, someone was asking if I have my uh, if I have my Bitcoin on my uh, on my hardware wallet, on my on my ledger or on my Trezor, and then I connect my hardware wallet to Casa, does that mean that my Bitcoin is secured by by Casa now? Um, and the answer is the answer is no. So it's really important to remember that you know this is uh, this is it's, it's a hard way to kind of think about it, but those hardware devices they only ever manage keys. All the Bitcoin in the world, whether it's yours, whether whether it's yours, Michael Saylor's, or Satoshi's, it's all on the same blockchain. If you're running your own node, which you absolutely should be doing, it is right there on your node. It is also on everyone else's node in the world. Um, so what the ledger and the treasure do is they hold a private key for you, um, and that private key allows you to allows you to move your Bitcoin, um, and the public key on it allows you to find your Bitcoin. So you give the public key to the node, node goes and finds the Bitcoin, then you can sign a message that moves that Bitcoin. So there's actually no connection whatsoever between the uh, between the Bitcoin that's stored with the private key in a one of one on your device and Bitcoin that's stored in a multi-sig, a three of five, even if that private key and that public key are used as part of that three of five. Totally separate things as far as the Bitcoin network is concerned, totally separate UTXOs. Um, they can't talk to each other. They don't really, they don't really, really know about each other. So you definitely have to take the step of sending your funds from your one of one single signature hardware device over to your uh, your new multi sig account uh, when you when you decide decide to go this route. It doesn't happen automatically. If it did, that would be a giant security vul vul vulnerability for the, for the whole network. So it's a very good thing that that's uh, that that's not possible. Cool. Thanks, Hector. Uh, we have a few folks wondering if Casa is ever going to offer or enable a Bitcoin lending product. 
So this is definitely something that uh, that we've looked at in the past. I don't think it's uh, currently on the roadmap. Um, there are some uh, there are some exciting new technical mm -hmm. de developments, and uh, my guess is that if we were to ever go that route, it would be through enabling some kind of cool uh, some kind of cool new technical features at the Bitcoin protocol level, or possibly at, uh, at, at layer two that would uh, that would allow you to earn earn on your Bitcoin that's being uh, that's being stored in Casa. So this is uh, pretty deep skunk works stuff here, but it's, uh, it's something we're thinking about, but don't have any uh, plans to implement in the near future. Um, and really the reasoning behind that is that it's just a very different business model. Uh, making money on uh, making money on lending and lending and borrowing requires a much higher degree of, uh, of control of, of, of the assets. Um, that's just not really something that we feel, uh, you know, we feel fits into the model of Casa. Um, our services are obviously expensive. And um, you know, and and we're we're very upfront about that. But what we're saying is that what you're paying for is the service. We're not making money from you on clicks. We're not making money selling your data. We're not making money, you know, based on, on off of you on um, you know on lend, lending lending and borrowing fees. Um, we are fully incentivized to just provide you an excellent key ma key management service. And so those are business decision design business design decisions. That I really get to the core of what it is that we're trying try to do here, and why we're uh, why we're pretty strict about some of this stuff. Cool. Uh, what are considered large quantities of Bitcoin? So this is a great question. Um, you know, and the way I think about this is, a large qu quantity of of Bitcoin is really going to be depending on the individual um, and depending on what your price targets are. So. We always think like, you know, Bitcoin does 10x. It is a thing that happens. It has happened historically. It has happened repeatedly. It's 10x within the last, uh, I don't, I'm not sure we're quite there yet. I'm not sure we quite hit, uh, hit like 35, uh, th sorry, th uh, 3,500 on the low back at, back in March. We're pretty much at a 10x over the past 12 months. So one thing that's important is to, you know, consider is your current level of security appropriate for a 10x increase in the Bitcoin price? Sometimes these things happen quickly. Um, you know, the Bitcoin price scales uh, scales very rapidly. The uh, the cost of service and support and uh, and the hard hard wallet supply chains they don't scale quite as as quickly. So if this is something you're think you're thinking about. Um, it certainly makes sense to uh, to begin to under understand it sooner rather than later. I'd also think about it in terms of uh, you know, in instead of thinking about it in terms of like an annual subscription, think about it in terms of you know what percentage of your of your uh, of your budget uh, of your investment in Bitcoin. Are you allocating to security? Is it one percent? Is it point point one one percent? Um, and you can kind of start start to do, start to do the, the math there. Um, and you know, we our pricing gets extremely com competitive once you uh, you know once you kind of start getting into the uh, the half a the half a per percent range of, uh, of 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 Bitcoin. So certainly, if you're uh, you know certainly over over a hundred thousand dollars is uh, is quite is quite a lot of, a lot of Bitcoin. Uh, if you start to get into the hundreds of hundreds of thousands and up, I would absolutely recommend that you. Uh, you start to think think hard hard about this that stuff, and although we certainly have clients that have substantially less than that, and you know, are paying in part to learn about how how this stuff works. I'm not sure they're going to stick with us forever. We uh, we certainly hope that they do. Uh, we also know that we're always competing against free services, um, and that there are a lot of great great free multi sig op options that are out there. Cool. Uh, I have a question here. Isn't the pin number on each hardware device a single point of failure? I.e., if I forget the pin on each device. And I lose, or if I set the pin on each device is the same, and I lose that pin, I then lose three keys. Yeah. So, and this is a great, great question. And we do see some trade-offs between the way the hardware manufacturers think about security and the way Casa thinks about security. You know, hardware manufacturers are they mostly think about one of one, you know, a one of one setup, um, and they're very incentivized to do that because that's what the bulk majority of their clients are uh, and their customers are using their devices for, um, and they have a lot of like. They have a lot of liability if they start to introduce features that uh, that degrade that that one of one that one of one security. Casa's perspective is that a lot of the things that that they do that make sense in one of one don't totally make sense in a in a multi state context. And the pin is big one is big one of those. Um, but we do recommend that clients always hold on to one of their seed phrases now, um, just in case you forget your all your pin codes. It's also really important to use a password manager to back up the, uh, the piece of, of information. Um, the pin code is one of them. Another really important one that, uh, that people don't always think about is, you know, if something happens to Casa, if we go down, you need to make sure that you have access to the public key for the Casa key and also for the mobile key as well. Um, and so these are this is all information that we provide you. We provide it in the app, we provide it via email, um, but it's really important that you print these things out, that you write down your pin, 
So there are a couple pieces of information. Those are the big ones, the pin code and the uh, and the sovereign recovery instructions. You wanna, you know, you wanna have in a password manager, you wanna print them out, save them with your, your, your important documents, and uh, think about how you can make those things really resilient and really recoverable if, uh, if start, stuff starts to go bad. Cool. Uh, how does the mobile key and CASA key work in the event of my passing? Would my wife or kids have access to these? So that, that's an excellent question. Um, we have two levels of service. At our, uh, at our, at our platinum tier of service, uh, the product is designed for a single in individual. Uh, there's some improvements we're looking to make here. But the bottom line is that, you know, for kind of liability reasons, uh, we wanna make sure that we have a really good process in place and that we're dotting the I's and crossing the T's from a legal perspective when it comes to uh, getting someone else access to, to your Bitcoin. And so basically what we say is that, you know, were you to pass away suddenly, we would please have your next kin reach out to us. We're happy to walk them through the situation. We are going to ask to see a death certificate to make sure that it's not a uh, it's not some uh, some crazy attack vector that, that we're seeing here. Um, and then we're also going to give them all the all the coaching on on how to do this, how to kind of manage the process. Um, and then, but also ultimately, we're going to need to be instructed by uh, you know by by a judge basically to tell us to okay, Casa, go ahead and use the Casa re recovery key to sign a transaction. Um, and so we cannot help, you know, your spouse, or your loved ones recover your Bitcoin if all of your keys are gone, if there's no access to your to your, mo to your mobile key, um, and if the only key that's available is the cost of recovery key. And that's a really important thing to remember. Now that said, um, at the diamond level, we do have our Covenant product. Um, Covenant is designed to integrate your Bitcoin account, um, your, uh, your, three, your three signature, uh, you know, premium level account, in with your estate plan. Uh, that's probably too in-depth of a conversation to go fully into today. But basically what we do is uh, is we work with your attorneys, we work with your uh, with your tr trustees, with uh, everyone who's involved in the inheritance process in your life. We'll work with them to uh, to kind of set it up so that your CASA account is fully recoverable. We have those, those plans in place. You and your next of kin fully understand what, what needs to happen there. Um, and we can also do, uh, do a few things when it comes to uh, hardening keys and, and adding in additional key managers at that level. Basically, the the extra money you're you're paying there is for uh, is for me to teach your lawyer about Bitcoin. Um, that's that's pr that's one of the uh, one of the one of the biggest uh, biggest changes at the diamond level. Your lawyer and your family um, and everyone else who's kind of a uh, kind of associated in your life with uh, with with ma with managing keys. Um, this is also a service that we provide if it's you know if it's a team, if you're a, a small family office or a small you know a small group of executives and uh, and treasury people at a uh, at, at a company. Um, we're able to kind of go in and help you design a, an approach to security that's going to be extremely secure, extremely resilient, and uh, and recoverable should uh, should things start to uh, start start to start to go the, the wrong way or start to go south in any of the unpredicted ways that are out there. Okay, let's uh, finish up here with two more questions. If anybody has asked a question that we haven't covered, uh, our apologies. Please hit that link in the bottom that says "Book One on One Time with Casa." And it would be the pleasure of our client services team to answer your questions um, directly. So next question, if you have a multi-sig such as a three of five and there's a spending transaction, can you tell from the transaction which keys were used to sign? This is a really good question. I believe the answer is no. Um, but I actually, I, I am not fully com confident that that's the, uh, that, that that's, that that's the case. Um, I would have to check check on that and get, and get back to you. But that's a really a really good good question. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll post something on Twitter in a little bit here. Um, I did want to touch on why we think three of five is the is the optimal set for for multi sig, which is uh which is one of the other questions here. When it when it comes to multi sig, you know, there's like we said, there's an infinite number of options. But three of five gets you is that you know if you ever lose one of your keys and you go down to a three to a three to four. You still have one level of of resiliency there, of of redundancy. So what that means is that you know you had five keys and you lose one, um, you can go ahead and replace it, and you can keep your four old keys, your what add in the one new key and create a brand new three or five three or five key set. And this really gives you a lot of flex flexibility. Um, if it's if you start to drop down the number of required signers to make that lower, um, you potentially introduce risk, substantial amount, amounts of risk in here because now there's uh, there's fewer number of keys that need to be exploited or attacked or hacked for um, you know for someone to for uh, someone to move your keys. Uh, if you increase the total number of uh, 
you know, the total number of keys, it just starts getting complicated and transactions start getting big. Um, so three or five is really stri strikes a great, uh, a great ba balance here. Um, one thing that I do always like to point out is that uh, the way CASA is designed, you only need one of your hardware keys. Um, the, uh, the mobile key is highly recoverable. The CASA recovery key is obviously uh, is highly persistent as well, which means that in a dire situation, if you're trying to escape, you know, escape in some, uh, you know, escape some, you know, some authoritarian go government that uh, that's trying to shut down, shut down Bitcoin. All you need to do is have one of your hardware wallets with you and you can recover, you can pretty much recover every, everything else, uh, but you're not at risk of having, you know, that, uh, you know, you're not at risk of having like that one hard, hardware wallet be like your, uh, your, your single, your single point of failure. Cool. All right. Do we have, how you, what are you feeling Hector? One more question. Yeah, we got, we got time for one more. All right, one more. Let's make it a good one. Um, scroll through here. To what degree will my identity remain private, i.e. any third party besides people I've identified? Um, I think he's asking, can you sign up for CASA anonymously? Yeah, absolutely. So we take Bitcoin payments. Um, we also let people sign up. All we require is an email address. Um, that's really it. You know, pay us, give us an, e an email address, and we can, uh, you know, we can make sure that that's the only information that we keep on on file for you. Um, we do like to ship you fresh, clean hardware and a couple of goodies that come uh, come with the, the standard Casa package. Um, if you use a PO box, if you use a remailer, those are always always uh, always good 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 ways to go. Um, we do wipe our we do wipe our data. We clear it out of uh, you know of all our of all all the. Uh, you know, any of our systems that are holding holding on to that stuff. Obviously, the ledger hack was really scary, um, and so uh, you know we're uh, you know we're with everyone else in the, in the industry mm -hmm. that's uh, taking extreme efforts to minimize the footprint of data that we're holding for our clients. But always, the best thing that you can do is take responsibility for your pri your privacy your, yourself. Learn to use PO boxes at, at kind of at kind of minimum, um, and there's some additional steps that you can take there. Uh, Jameson has a great in-depth blog post about this, as he does on all topics related to Bitcoin security, um, that'll walk you through a ton of hardcore steps you can you can do. Um, and certainly if you were exposed in that in that hack, um, it is well worth considering upgrading to multi-sig and diversifying your uh, you know, diversifying how your Bitcoin is is being stored to make sure that there's no one place for an attacker to uh, to go get it. 